Good afternoon, children. Welcome to the world of Granny Grange's stories. First of all, I want to show you my lucky rabbit. He goes with me everywhere and he brings me good luck. And his name is Pierre because I'm living in France now and he's a French rabbit. Now I'll go to my stories. Now what shall I do first? Well, I think I'm going to read you a story about a garden gnome. Well, this is called The Kidnap of Nobby, the Garden Gnome. Boom, boom, Mr Baxter Mike to his friends, who had been reading the Sunday papers in his most favourite comfy green leather armchair, dozing off as he always did after a few minutes reading, woke up with a start. What was that, Millie? he inquired of Mrs Baxter, a cheerful, house-proud lady who was clickety-clicking away at her knitting, making another of her useless, enormous pullovers for Mr Baxter, never to be worn. Millie Baxter put down her glasses, placed the multicoloured knitting into the purpose-made knitting basket and rushed over to the sitting-room window with a view over their huge back garden, backing on to the main busy coastal road to Brighton. The garden was Mr Baxter's pride and joy, and he spent many hours a week mowing the grass in season, hoeing the weeds in his immaculate vegetable garden, most of the vegetables, including the Brussels sprouts, seeming to stand like soldiers, saluting their general. Mr Baxter had a tame red robin who, when he was digging the soil, used to come and perch cheekily on a branch nearby, ready to dive on a tasty, unsuspecting worm or two. Prizes had been won at local garden fates by the Baxters, particularly carrots and onions being their speciality. Trophies proudly displayed on the family sideboard commemorating the high standard and quality of vegetables were a tribute to Mr Baxter's tireless work in his beloved garden. Millie Baxter heard the boom boom again and saw a young man clad in black motorbike leathers in her garden picking something up and furtively putting it in his red rucksack. She looked again and her cheeks became red with anger as she banged at the lounge window, furiously shouting, Put Nobby back, you scoundrel! Put our gnome back, you horrible thief! For you see, Nobby was a treasured garden ornament placed at the bottom of the garden under the old gnarled oak tree. He had been painted in blue, yellow, red and green, with a cheerful, bearded smile on his face. He had been a prize at last year's Garden Fete, won by the Baxters for a collage collection of vegetables and flowers they had submitted for a competition. They had called him Nobby and placed him at the end of the lawn in a shady spot, visible by the, from the Baxters' kitchen and lounge windows next to a garden bench that the Baxters often sat on having a refreshing cup of tea and a ginger nut biscuit after a long day working in the garden. They loved their gnome and passers-by often remarked how cheerful Nobby looked. Every garden should have a gnome at the end of it, remarked Millie Baxter on one occasion as she supped her tea looking very contentedly at Nobby. Nobby too loved being in the garden. At night time his friends came round to visit him. Florence Fairy, always full of gossip to impart about the garden community, was bursting to tell Nobby the latest piece of garden scandal. You will never believe it, but Nigel Snell has entered himself for the prestigious Beech Tree Marathon. Ha ha! Florence laughed. He doesn't stand a chance, but he has gone ahead 
and painted his shell the champion's colour of gold all over. What a cheek! She said, still very amused at Nigel Snell's self-belief. Mrs Baxter, who had been shouting and knocking at the lounge window, began to cry, tears streaming down her face. I feel so helpless, she said to a startled Mr Baxter, who was not used to seeing his wife so distressed. Nobby's gone. Our Nobby's gone. Taken by that thief on the motorbike. And with that, another boom boom was heard as the ne'er-do-well biker revved up his bike and sped away. Only a blank space where Nobby once stood was to be seen by the garden bench. There, there, said Mr Baxter, putting his arms around his wife, trying to comfort her. We will tell the police and see if the scoundrel can be apprehended. But I will never see Nobby again, wailed, wailed Mrs Baxter. He was a sort of friend to us, always a cheerful face. He he made me so very happy whenever I looked at him. Mrs Baxter was beside herself with misery. Mr Baxter picked up the telephone, trying to take command of the situation, feeling responsible as the man of the house, and dialed the local police station. Uh, I'd like to report a crime. Um, um, Nobby, our garden gnome, has just been stolen by a young villain in black leathers, red rucksack and riding a very powerful motorbike. It looked like a Harley Davidson. Mr Baxter was trying to be as detailed as possible to aid the police. PC Donald Smith scratched his bald head as he was receiving this emergency call. He was used to receiving many reports of different crimes, but never before a stolen garden gnome. Don't you worry, Mr Baxter. We will investigate this unusual crime. I shall put this on my report sheet now. I shall need a full description of the rider and the bike, and we shall see what we can do to get your gnome back, said Mr PC Smith in a very professional, measured tone. Mr Baxter put the phone down and turned to his dear, his tearful wife. Come on, Millie, it is in the hands of the police now. I will make you a nice cup of tea with one of your favourite ginger nut biscuits. Now don't you worry, my love. Nobby will be returned to us one day. You wait and see. You see, dear reader, Nobby was stolen by Luke Griffiths, a young man of 25 years, who had been dared by his friends who knew about his ambitions to travel around the world on his motorbike, to take a garden gnome with him, and the gnome he had chosen at random, because Luke had seen Nobby most days as he travelled past the Baxter's garden as he was on his way to work. And of course, the gnome he chose was Nobby. Luke had been given a year's sabbatical leave from the travel magazine that he worked for to travel around the world, testing different parts of the Harley, Harley Davidson motorbike. Dear me, poor Mrs Baxter. Sponsorship for this project had been given to Luke by the motorbike company. This coincided with his main brief from the glossy magazine where the busy no-nonsense editor bespectacled Raymond Hampton had recognised a natural talent in Luke and decided to send him round the world as a travel reporter, writing up all his adventures and taking as many photographs as possible. With the sponsorship money from the motorbike company Raymond Hampton had decided the project was worth promoting and Luke was given the assignment much to his great delight. What Mr and Mrs Baxter didn't know was that Luke had left an envelope in a plastic folder in the place where Nobby had stood 
stating that the garden gnome was only borrowed would be travelling around the world with himself Luke on the back of a Harley Davidson and would be returned after a year. Can you imagine Mr and Mrs Baxter's amazement and joy when they read the letter and of course their resentment of not being asked or consorted, or, or consulted to what amounted to a kidnap of a garden gnome. What incredible adventures were in store for Luke and Nobby. But that is for another story. Well, dear readers, I hope we hear what happens to Nobby because I imagine he had tremendous, tremendous adventures. So I'm going to read you another story. I shall look at what I can see and pick something. Yes, I think I'll pick this one. This is called The Adventures of Molly Mouse. Now Molly Mouse was no ordinary mouse. For one thing, she had been born without a tail. And for another, instead of her fur being coloured brown, her fur was a bright red all over. Her, fur, her father, Colonel Jack Montague Mouse, said jokingly it was because Millicent had been his wife had been more than friendly with Bob Squirrel, the red-furred milkman. <laughs> this was a family joke repeated and laughed over many times. The fact was, however, that Molly stood out in a crowd and there was no possibility of her being allowed to melt into the background. Molly had really got used to it and at two years old, equivalent to humans 15 years, Molly wanted to do something and everything and was not fazed by having no tail and being red, oh no. She had started going to nightclubs with her family friend Emily Vole. The local nightclub called Moulin Music was their favourite, followed by the Do Re Mi Dance Centre run by Stanley Stagg and his family, the biggest deer being Donald, who was the club's bouncer and extremely handsome. All the girls wanted a date with him. Molly Mouse's family was extensive. So many brothers and sisters and aunts and aunts, cousins, that she had lost count. The only time they all got together was at one big fete in the summer called Mousenberry. Always the first week in July each year where there was different mouse bands, celebrities such as Mango Mouse, who always performed in tight leather trousers and an open neck white shirt, showing off his furry chest, and a gold medallion. The females in the audience all used to scream and yell when he came on the stage, wiggling his body to the rhythm of the music. In the past, when Molly arrived at the local nightclub, no one asked her to dance, as she was thought to be odd. In fact, very odd. No tail and bright red fur. She and Emily Vole would sit in a corner alcove off the end of the dance floor and, and just watch, envying high-flying dancers with their designer clothes, for example, Louis Mousson handbags, mini shoe shoes, always very popular with the jet set. However, Molly and Emily only had eyes for the most handsome and popular male dancer, Pierre, who had a French father, hence his name, and an English mother. His father, a commandant in the French army, Francois Didier, had been on manoeuvres with the first foot patrol passing through the Euro tunnel to England where he had met and fallen in love with a very pretty English mouse called Matilda. He had sustained a broken leg while scrambling up a strategic rock in a battle against the English rat cavalry and Matilda had nursed him back to health. P 
Pierre had the longest tail, the brightest eyes, wearing coolest t-shirts and shades, and his dance moves were perfection itself. When he took to the dance floor with any girl mouse of his choice, everyone stopped what they were doing and just gasped in admiration and total jealousy. Well, something happened that was to change Mel Molly Mouse's life forever. Pierre, who although popular and spoilt, actually underneath all that handsome fur was a nice and kind kindly mouse. He was courageous and his territory, he had 15 cats to keep in check including big fat Sebastian, a colourful tabby cat with fierce claws and a menacing smile showing all his sharp teeth that could give a wicked bite. On Pierre's nocturnal rounds he would visit the Donaldson household where Sebastian had a luxury silk covered cat box to sleep in. Mr Donaldson regularly left cheese in a vicious looking metal mouse trap to try and catch Pierre but he was too quick for them and used to nibble the end of the cheese until there was a sudden snap but Pierre judged it well and was well out of the way by the time the trap sprung closed. He did this many of the households he visited thus ensuring his daily supplies of protein. There was one or two times when his brain was a little bit befuddled from the night before dancing and partying that the cats, like Sebastian or the traps, nearly caught him. But he was a mouse with nine lives. There was excitement in the mouse world. The management of Mouse and Berry, the annual music and dancing festival, had decided there should be a competition to find the best dance couple. And the prize winners would get a prestigious silver cup and a cheque worth a hundred pounds, which of course was a great deal of money. Pierre chose his partner, Veronique Mouse, who always wore short skirts to show off her long legs and was a very good mover. All the other mice paired off but alas no one wanted to partner up with Molly because of her brightly coloured fur and no tail. All the pairs had been practicing morning, noon and night and a very high standard of dancing was being displayed in rehearsals. Molly, although she hadn't got a partner, because she loved dancing so much, practiced all the different moves with her antogram playing the rhythmic music. The antogram was a contraption for playing CDs which involved hundreds of little ants running round the CD as fast as they possibly could. Nerves were running high as the competition day loomed nearer. There was much rivalry amongst the t contestants particularly the females, with their choice of dresses and jewellery. The girls all wanted to outdo one another, so the variety of dress designs were amazing, with bling earrings and necklaces and glittering clips for the effects on tails and ears. Molly's mother, who was a dressmaker and made all the family clothes, decided she would make Molly the most lovely disco dance dress you have ever seen. It was a bright sea green with sequins in patterns glistening all over it and frills of lace underneath the hem appearing enticingly when Molly twirled. Molly did not tell her mother she had not got a partner for the dance contest and hoped that she would not find out. The evening was here and Molly's mother was fussing about asking when her partner would be arriving. Molly said vaguely that she would be meeting him at the competition centre and would not be too late back home that evening. Millicent Mouse, Molly's mother, 
thought her daughter looked beautiful in the new dress she had made. She had made her. She said, Molly, I have something special to give you. What is it? said a surprised Molly. Millicent went over to her prized mahogany antique chest of drawers and pulled out a blue velvet box. She handed it to Molly and said, I have been waiting for the right moment to pass these on to you and I think tonight is the night. Wear them with my love. I was given these earrings by my grandmother Esmeralda Mouse when I was your age. Molly opened up the box gently with pleasure written all over her face and sure enough there was the most beautiful dangly sea pearl earrings. Three low, large pearls to each earring. Molly smoke, spoke with emotion. Thank you so much mother, they are beautiful and I will always, always treasure them and look after them until I have a daughter of my own to pass them on to. Molly and her mother quickly hugged one another affectionately and the earrings were fixed on Molly's ears and with a quick glance in the mirror, Molly scurried off saying goodbye to her family as she headed towards the dance competition centre. A strange thing happened that night, which was to change Molly's life forever. As chance would have it, Veronique or Veronica, the glamorous partner who Pierre had chosen, had had a narrow escape with a mousetrap and injured her leg when the cheese she had been nibbling caused the mousetrap to snap. She had just managed to avoid avoid the spring apart from her back leg. With a great deal of difficulty she had extracted herself from the evil trap but alas her leg was broken and she could not dance. I'm just going to tell you that my black cat Bonaparte is trying to come in to listen to the stories so I shall let him in in a minute and he can listen to the stories as well. When Pierre arrived at the dance, he found he was without a partner. He looked around and could probably have chosen any of the females he wanted, but he saw Molly sitting in the corner with her lovely sea green dress on, pearl earrings and red fur, and was totally entranced. He thought she looked absolutely beautiful. Why hadn't he seen this gorgeous creature before, he thought to himself. He went up to her and said, Would you do me the honour of being my partner for the competition tonight? Molly gave him a demure, mousy smile and said she would be delighted. Each couple were given a number to place on the back of the male dancer and then the rolling logs started up the best squirrel rock band in town who everyone raved about with a good rock rhythm and the competition commenced. Pierre and Molly were given number 32 and soon it was their turn to impress the judges panel of six made up of various rodents and forest animals Ronald Rat, Mango Mouse, Geoffrey Jackdaw, Harry Hedgehog, Beatrice Bat and Reggie Rabbit, the chairman, all jockeying for a comfortable place at the judges' table. Pierre was totally surprised at what a good dancer Molly was. All those hours of practice had come in very useful. There was a hush of total pleasure from the audience witnessing for a moment the magic that was in the air as the pair danced to perfection, each anticipating each other's dance moves. Pierre threw Molly over his shoulders between his legs, all sequences perfectly executed in seamless continuity. 
The end of the evening came and there was great anticipation on the dance floor. The chairman of the panel of judges, Reggie Rabbit, made his way purposely, purposefully to the lily microphone, cleared his throat <coughs> and made the following announcement. It gives me great pleasure to name the winners of this competition and may I say thoroughly deserved. Pierre and Molly, number 32. And with that, an ecstatic Molly and Pierre received the cup, soon to have their names engraved on it, and a cheque for a hundred pounds each. After that evening, Molly and Pierre became inseparable and won many other dance championships. Molly became a celebrity, and so all the female mices wanted to copy her. The little grocery shops and beauticians were completely sold out of red fur dye. They all wanted their fur to be red, just like Molly's. Some of the most enthusiastic fans even went to the extent of having their tails cut off, frowned upon by their parents, but such was their urge to look like Molly. Who would have thought a little mouse with red fur and no tail, with no, who no one wanted to be friends with, thought to be odd, would have a change around to become the most famous dance celebrity mouse ever. It is just like the old saying, do not judge a book by its cover. In other words, look beneath clothes and what you see first in someone and you may discover untold talents and generosity of spirit that makes them very special. No matter what perceived effects you think you have, follow your dreams no matter how far away they seem and who knows what can be accomplished. Be on the outlook for a mouse without a tail and red for scurrying into a hole or a little nook and cranny and you can smile to yourself because you will know the secret why. As a footnote to this story, Pierre went on to marry Molly and they had a daughter Miranda who Molly at the appropriate time passed on the precious family pearl earrings. Well, dear little Molly Mouse who made it in the end to to be something wonderful. Well what can I do next? Something different perhaps. Yes something different. I wonder what we can do. Perhaps a story for the little ones. I have one here. Yes, here's one for the little ones. Sammy the Disobedient Steam Engine. Sammy was a new steam engine, just newly delivered to Whitney Junction, a busy railway centre which Julian Jenkins, station master, ran with precision and punctuality. He would not tolerate any backsliding or bad behaviour from any of his engines, which included Thomas the Tank Engine, assigned to keep things moving as efficiently as possible. All the steam engines were treated exactly the same. Discipline and fairness was the motto of the day, as station master Jenkins used to tell all his new steam engines on arrival. Sammy felt he looked handsome, and so he did. Yellow paintwork, black fenders, and a red chimney which bellowed smoke when Jacob Jones the fireman stoked the little engine's boiler, full to bursting with nuggets of the best Welsh coal. Whitney Junction was Sammy's first assignment and because he was the newest, 
he was meant to follow instructions carefully and watch what the other engines did in order to run as efficiently as the other more experienced engines and in particular to getting good books of Julian Jenkins, the Welsh strict station master, a man not to make cross or annoyed. This is where the trouble started. Sammy thought that as he was so handsome, he did not need to be obedient and listen to instructions from the station master and his engine driver, Donald Drew. Donald and Jacob Jones, the fireman, had been given Sammy to put through his paces and run on the Whitney to London line, carrying carriages full of passengers to and from London in their sober office attire. Sammy pulled six carriages and he had precise instructions to pull up in line with number two sign on platform one so that all passengers could get on in comfort with no big gaps between the platform and the carriage. He was told that if he stopped at number one sign, sign it would definitely be more dangerous for the passengers and Julian Jenkins as station master of Whitney had a reputation to uphold as being the most user-friendly station in the region. So you see how important it was to get the positioning of the carriages absolutely correct. The first morning, Sammy was all stoked up with Welsh coal, great flames leaping from the steel boiler stoked by fireman Jacob Jones. The six carriages had been attached and he had steamed gently towards platform one at Whitney Junction, the precise instructions being emphasised by a Harris driver, Donald, who had got up late and was feeling quite grumpy and did not want any trouble from a new engine. However, this was not to be. Mostly when you are new, you look about you to see what you should be doing and obey instructions. That is the wisest thing to do. But no, Sammy thought he was the best, handsome in his new paint, above being told what to do. What a big mistake. Sammy thought that instead of stopping at number two sign, he would instead stop at number one sign where he saw Dory's steam engine at platform two building up steam to take her passengers to the seaside. Sammy, feeling very important, said, Good morning, Doris. You are looking very fine in your mauve paintwork. Doris felt very flattered to be recognised and spoken to by a city route steam engine, and in return she said, Oh, thank you, Sammy. You too are looking extremely smart in your yellow paintwork. Donald Drew, Sammy's driver, was furious. You are a naughty and disobedient steam engine. You were instructed to stop at number two sign on platform one and you have stopped at number one. We are in a lot of trouble from Mr Jenkins, the station master. How could you be so stupid and big-headed? Why didn't you listen to instructions and do as you were told, shouted a, a usually calm Donald. Sammy was amazed and alarmed at the barrage of furious words being hurled at him. I, I'm, I, I'm so sorry said a subdued Sammy, feeling very guilty and worried about the ticking off he would get from the strict station master. I, I, I will not let it happen again, carried on Sammy, hoping to be forgiven. Well, you had better not, said Donald Drew. As I am your driver, I have full responsibility for you. Oh dear, here comes Mr Jenkins, our station master. I shall have to think of a good explanation as to why we have stopped at number one sign instead of number two. 
Mr. Drew! Mr. Drew! shouted the station master sharply. What do you think you are doing stopping at number one sign when you were clearly instructed to stop at number two? All our passengers are complaining. This is not good enough. I'm so sorry, Station Master Jenkins, um, but a bit of coal dust got in my eyes and I just could not see the station signs for a moment. The driver's face became bright red and he looked very uncomfortable. I'm not used to telling porky pies, he muttered to his amazed fireman, Jacob Jones, and so was not very convincing. You see... Jacob knew the driver to be a very honest man and had never heard him tell an untruth ever before. That is just an excuse, Mr Drew. I do believe you're covering up for that naughty new steam engine, Sammy. I will take no disciplinary action this time, but may this be a warning to you, Sammy Engine. I will be watching you closely and any misbehaviour and you will be off to the shunting yard moving coal tracks about. Listen to instructions in the future. They are given to you for a reason. And with that, Mr Jenkins, station master, walked purposely back to his office to make a note of the dis dismeanour on his daily logbook. Oh, poor Sammy, but he was so naughty. Sammy's steam engine felt awful. On his first day, when he wanted to impress, he had let himself down by being too selfish and disobedient, and in so doing had let down his driver and fireman. A dejected Sammy said to a now calmer Mr Drew driver, a Mr Jones fireman, I really am very, very sorry. I thought I was a smart and handsome steam engine that need not obey instructions, but now I see that my disobedient behaviour has made you both very unhappy and angry. Please will you forgive me and I will work hard to make us the best steam engine on the London line. Donald Drew coughed <coughs> and shook his head whilst Jacob Jones smiled as he thought Sammy had the makings of a first class efficient steam engine. From that day onwards Sammy turned into a really hard working engine pulling the carriages to town day after day and arriving punctually at precisely the correct times, much to the satisfaction of Julian Jenkins, the strict time-watching station master. As a footnote, after two years, Sammy won a medal for being the best turned out paintwork, looking shiny and most punctual steam engine in the region and proudly wore the medal on his chimney stack. Doris often commented that she had been the making of Sammy after their first meeting. Wow, that was good that Sammy listened to instructions at the end. That was very good. Well, what's another story for you? What one can I tell you? I know, I know, this story. The tale of Terence Toothbrush. Let me look at these other stories. Is there a better one? I, yes. Well, we'll try this one. Are you sitting comfortably? Then I shall start. The Tale of Terence Toothbrush Pierre, are you sitting comfortably? Good. 
Terence Toothbrush stood slouching miserably, leaning up against Wilbur Toothpaste. Both were in a white chipped enamel tin mug, placed casually on the bathroom window sill by only child Charlie Winters, a nine-year-old Cub Scout, who was good at most things with one exception, cleaning his teeth. Charlie did not see any reason for cleaning his teeth, so he had picked an old camping mug to put his toothbrush and toothpaste in, thinking that he would never have to use it much. Every morning his busy, bustling mother, who worked at a local dentist as a receptionist, would always shout up the stairs just as Charlie was getting ready for school. Charlie, have you brushed your teeth? The answer floating down the stairs would usually be in a minute, Mum. I'm just finishing my homework. Or, I'm just feeding the goldfish in my bedroom. In a minute, Mum. And so on. Every excuse under the sun to try and get out of washing his teeth. Mrs Jane Winters, who everyone knew and liked, tried to impress on her young son the importance of cleaning his teeth and was often to be heard saying, You will get holes in your teeth, Charlie, and they will fall out if you do not clean your teeth every day. So this was the reason that Terence's toothbrush was feeling miserable and lonely. He had no job to do. Nobody wanted him. Least of all his young owner, Charlie. Wilbur toothpaste, on the other hand, was always being squeezed, used and put back in the mug as Jane Winters liked the particular brand of toothpaste, peppermint, which Charlie had chosen in the supermarket and very often used it herself. Her husband, Henry, preferring a completely different flavour. It's all right for you, said Terence to toothbrush dolefully. Someone wants to use you. You have a job and Mrs Winter loves you and your taste. Nobody loves me. Oh, stop being such a misery person. Something will happen, you will see, and Charlie will start using you one day, I'm sure. Always the optimist was Wilbur Toothpaste. One day something did happen to change everything in the household. It came in the name of a little girl called Patricia. She was a pretty curly-haired blonde little girl with a cheeky smile and sparkling white teeth, only six years old. Her mother Marigold, Jane's sister, had been in a serious car accident and broken a few bones so that she had been in hospital for a few weeks. So Patricia had come to stay with Jane and Henry Winters and Charlie. That's Boney at the window, by the way. He's still trying to get in to listen to this story. The day Patricia arrived, she was tearful. She missed her mother so much. Her father, Patrick, worked as an engineer on the oil rigs in a very important job, earning lots of money and could not afford to be off work for more than two weeks. So there had been a family meeting and it was decided that Patricia would stay with her cousin and family for a few weeks whilst her mother Marigold recovered enough to return home and look after her household. So there it was. Marigold, Patricia's mother, had told her young lively daughter that she must go and stay with her Aunt Jane and Uncle Henry and Charlie, her practical joker cousin. She was to be good, obedient and do exactly what was asked of her. Difficult instructions for her to keep to as Patricia was curious about everything, wanted to know how things worked, where did things come from, always asking questions never wanting to go to bed at night in case she missed out on something. With her mother's words ringing in her ears, Patricia had left her home with her Auntie Jane. 
Jane Winters drove her niece in a little green vintage Morris Minor, her pride and joy, to the Winters family home some hundred miles away. Patricia lived in town. Her cousin Charlie and family lived in the country with numerous different pet animals. Patricia was shown to the guest bedroom, a brightly aired room with primrose wallpaper and blue striped curtains. The first thing Patricia did before unpacking was to check the bed out. Had her cousin Charlie put a frog in the bed, a spider under the pillow, prickly thistles in between the duvet and the mattress? Nothing was found. With a sigh of relief, she smiled to herself, safe for the moment from her cousin's practical jokes, but making a mental note to keep alert and be one step ahead of her mischievous cousin. The first thing to be unpacked was Dorothy, her most favourite patchwork doll, with long brown ringlets made of wool and a white lacy cap, a mop cap in fact, who was given to her by her ever-loving granny when she was born. There you are, Dorothy, said Patricia. I will not be lonely as I have you to talk to before I go to sleep. The next item she unpacked was her pink flowery wash bag. She opened it quickly and pulled out her pretty pink striped toothbrush, peppermint flavoured toothpaste and a white newly washed flannel. Patricia entered the family bathroom with large white enamel bath, shower over, WC, wash hand basin and she glanced up at the windowsill where she spied a chipped old tin mug with a blue toothbrush and toothpaste in it. She immediately placed her toothbrush and toothpaste in the mug alongside Charlie's hardly used teeth cleaning brush and paste and started singing to herself, feeling much more relaxed and happy now that she had unpacked a few of her familiar things. Terence toothbrush shocked by the sudden appearance of another toothbrush and toothpaste in his chipped in mug, his domain was then rendered speechless as Wilbur toothpaste recalled much later when they were remembering the first time Terence has set eyes on the most charming, beautiful, wonderful toothbrush called Prunella and had fallen instantly in love. Wilbur Toothpaste was very excited to have a new friend called Tommy Toothpaste standing with him in the toothbrush mug and what was more surprising he had exactly the same flavour as his own peppermint. Wilbur and Tommy became firm friends with Tommy Toothpaste always making jokes so that life in the old enamel mug became very enjoyable for the two pairs of toothbrushes and toothpaste. Wilbur getting squeezed night and morning by Mrs Winter and Tommy being squeezed by, Patricia's, by, by Patricia. But sadly, Charlie did not use Terence's toothbrush who felt so neglected and unhappy. I say, Tommy, is Prunella with you? I, I, I mean, Terence said, hesitatingly, trying not to sound too nosy. Um, is Prunella your girlfriend? You know, are you walking out together? Oh, no, 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 my friend, said Tommy Toothpaste, laughing. Prunella and I are just good friends. I get the squeezes, she gets the brushing. That's our life. And we love making teeth clean, said a smiling Tommy. When Terence Toothbrush heard this confirmation that Prunella was indeed single at the moment, he was the happiest toothbrush in the world, for he had completely fallen head over heels in love with this beautiful, kind and elegant toothbrush called Prunella, now standing smiling at him in the tooth mug. He wondered if Prunella felt the same about him. That evening, 
Patricia came into the family bathroom to clean her teeth. Prunella toothbrush was taken out of the mug and Tommy toothpaste was squeezed so that a little of the likeable peppermint toothpaste was spread all over the bristles of the lovely Prunella toothbrush. Patricia cleaned her teeth with vigour up and down and round and about. When finished, she ran cleansing cold water over Prunella's bristles to clean them, ready for the morning, and then put Tommy toothpaste back to back with Wilbur in the enamel mug. Patricia was just about to leave the bathroom to say goodnight to her aunt and uncle when she noticed that Terence's toothbrush had not been used. In fact, his bristles were so dry he had probably not been used for days, she thought. Patricia ran to Charlie's bedroom where she found him in the middle of sticking his model aircraft together with glue and clothes pegs and really did not want to be disturbed by a mere girl. Charlie, I can see you have not been using your toothbrush and your teeth are looking brown, dirty and disgusting. Not a lovely white colour like mine, said Patricia, feeling very superior. Why don't you brush your teeth? Patricia continued persistently. You know your teeth will drop out if you don't watch it, she said, and you will be in agony of pain and the tooth fairy will not come because you have caused your teeth to drop out. Patricia went on and on. Stop it, Patricia. You sound just like Mum. I never remember to clean my teeth. I have much more important things to do with my time, Charlie said defensively. Well, I'm telling you, continued Patricia, you will suffer with very bad toothache. And if you don't start cleaning your teeth, you mark my words, you'll be in pain. With that, Patricia flounced out of Charlie's bedroom, feeling good about herself after giving her cousin a good lecture on dental hygiene. Well, the very next day, Charlie woke up with a twinge on his front tooth. Oh no, not toothache, he thought to himself. Immediately he went to the windowsill where the chipped enamel mug, tooth mug, sat and picked up Terence's toothbrush and Wilbur toothpaste and commenced to squeeze Wilbur and start to brush his teeth, frightened now that he would have a tooth fall out through lack of cleaning. Patricia's taunting words were coming true. Terence could not believe it. At last he was being used. A huge smile appeared on his bristly face. Suddenly he was not only of use but really wanted. Charlie was so apprehensive about the possibility of having toothache in the future and perhaps of his teeth falling out through lack of cleaning that he continued to brush his teeth conscientiously every night and morning. The toothache disappeared, but not Charlie's determination to keep his teeth white and gleaming with no decay in them. Terence, on the other hand, grew in stature and confidence enough to ask Prunella Toothbrush if she, if she would take a turn around the tooth mug with him. She not only agreed, but held his hand and smiled up at him. Do you know, Terence, you are the most handsome toothbrush I have ever met? So there it was. Patricia had been such a good influence on her cousin regarding cleaning his teeth. He in turn took Patricia to the barn where they had six new Labrador puppies suckling with their mother Dolly, a lovely black and very maternal mother, looking on contentedly at her new offspring. They had such fun while Marigold, Patricia's mother, was recuperating. The joy and friendship in the enamel tooth mug was amazing. Terence, now a strong, confident, fine toothbrush, was trying to impress Prunella 
with his prowess as a hard worker now that Charlie was using him night and morning. Prunella de Muley said that perhaps Terence could be her boyfriend, and at night time they were to be seen holding hands, looking into each other's eyes, dreaming of their very own tooth mug that they might have together one day, whilst Wimber and Wilbur and Tommy joked and laughed until their sides split and their screw-top cats fell off their toothpaste tubes. So, dear friends, you see how important it is to clean your teeth every morning and evening. It makes the toothbrush and toothpaste happy and, of course, stops your teeth falling out. Very important. This one is called the back pocket job. The sunset was magnificent, a beautiful orange, pink, blue, grey and white mixture. What a glorious feast of colours, thought ten-year-old Kieran MacDonald as she sat on one of the tufted grass sand dunes, pensively watching this array of magical coloured sunbeams dancing on the natural blue and green tide gradually encroaching on the silver sandy beach in a little used part of the Norfolk coastline. The bird life were beginning to swell in numbers, mainly seagulls, playfully jumping and diving in the waves. Kieran was an only child and often came down to the beach very early in the morning to catch the sunrise with her inseparable canine friend Monty, a well-mannered black Labrador with attitude but with an uncanny intuition to Kieran's moods. Monty was always there when she would sometimes tell him tearfully of the current problems she was experiencing. Always receptive, wise, affectionate, a doleful look on his face if required, so when Kieran had a problem, she knew she could pour her heart out to her doggy best friend Monty, very often getting a sympathetic lick on her cheek, an ear, as if to say, I'm here, I'm listening, and it's not that bad really. Kieran loved Monty dearly, and naturally, Monty loved Kieran, his little mistress, unconditionally. Kieran's parents, Annie and Ferguson MacDonald, adored their only daughter. Ferguson worked for the Foreign Office and so travelled to many parts of the world. An interesting job which involved his foreign language expertise. Sometimes he took Mrs MacDonald, Annie, and Kieran would be looked after by her Auntie Jill, her mother's sister, a very favourite aunt who was kind but stood no nonsense. For instance, if Kieran was slouching as she sat at the table, Aunt Jill would always say, Sack of potatoes, sit up straight, or you'll never grow tall. Kieran didn't particularly want to get tall, but always did what her aunt instructed. She loved her Aunt Jill. The next door neighbour on this lovely stretch of Norfolk Beach was a family called Morrison. Andrew Morrison was a tall, handsome Scotsman and his wife Fiona, a blonde, curly-haired, slightly snobbish lady and they had produced two lively sons called Fraser, 10 years old, and Ewan, 13 years, both with distinctive black hair and an extra helping of energy and boisterousness. Andrew Morrison, their father, was often to be heard remonstrating with his wife. Don't be so hard on the boys, Fiona. They're just showing character and personality. Fiona would utter, I cannot have them climbing those cliffs, Andrew. You know how dangerous they are. Or... I cannot have those boys playing in the old Grand Hotel. The roof is so dangerous. And so on. Only to be laughed at by her husband, who was proud of his son's adventurous spirits, 
and remembered back to his childhood when he had carried out the same sort of antics. The old hotel on the waterfront, the old grand, sadly standing in a state of disrepair, almost derelict after not being used for 40 years, was a magnet for the young boys. They had been in every single room, discovering old bits of furniture and old items to play with and had even gone on a ghost hunt one night unbeknown to their parents. Fraser took a particularly liking to Karen, Kieran, his late neighbour, and the same age. In fact, the first time he had been introduced, he had liked her bubbly personality and her sense of adventure similar to his. She was curious about things and had an endearing ability to find good in everything and everyone. Fraser and Kieran became the best of friends and Ewan, slightly older at 13, began to think of the two as silly youngsters and did not take much interest in their adventures. Apart from the visits to the haunted Grand Hotel, which he would not have missed. Such fun frightening his younger brother and their neighbour's daughter Kieran, mostly by making ghostly noises and the odd time he had bought a white sheet with a torch and had laughed and laughed at the terrified two who had run out into the hotel grounds trembling from top to toe and screaming their heads off with fright. Life was pleasant, interesting and adventuresome for Fraser until one day Kieran was missing from the normal meeting place on the beach by the, their deck chair store. Three or four days went by and Fraser started to get worried. He was such good friends with Kieran and, and missed her lively company, but did not particularly want to call around to Kieran's house as he did not like the way Mrs MacDonald always told him off for leaving, leading his daughter astray. She felt her daughter should behave more sedately and be interested in young ladies' activities not climbing cliffs and exploring derelict hotels, coming home muddy, dirty, sometimes with torn clothing. Fraser could bear it no longer and decided to face Mrs. MacDonald's sharp tongue and went the next morning to Kieran's house and knocked tentatively on the front door. Mrs. MacDonald appeared, not a hair out of place, painted nails and pink hostess apron tied round her trim waist um, is Kieran in? asked Fraser, trying to be pleasant. Mrs MacDonald was not her usual Bruce self and seemed very distracted. Um, uh, well, I'm sorry, Fraser. Unfortunately, um, Monty's Kieran's dog was run over by a milk lorry two days ago and, and Kieran is completely heartbroken and will not leave the house or see anyone. I'm at my wit's end to know what to do with her, said an anxious Mrs MacDonald, who drew out a white handkerchief and sobbed silently into it. Is it possible for me to see Kieran? said Fraser sympathetically. Oh no, Fraser, what could you do to help? Oh no, you go to Ki No, no, you go home. Kieran will not be available to come out and play with you for a long while. And with that she shut the door, not wishing to enter into any more discussion on the matter. Fraser was not going to take no for an answer. His best friend, Kieran, was in trouble and he wanted to help her, talk to her, to try and get to see that, although it was a very sad situation, when you lose a pet, that you must rejoice in the times you had together, remember them in your heart, put the memories in your back pocket to be taken out and treasured at any time, then on would you go. Fraser's Scottish granny had imparted these words of wisdom to him when he was a little boy after the unexpected death of his favourite ginger tom called Biscuit. Fraser was determined to see his best friend Kieran and help her to get over this sad time. What to do? 
A plan began to materialise and Fraser went home, a stubborn look on his face, which always meant that whatever he decided to do, he would carry it out, come what may. At 6am, Fraser awoke to the sun beginning to rise as he looked out of his bedroom window and across at the McDonald's house, bathed in the beams from the early morning sunrise. He put on his blue tracksuit and crept downstairs, ran out of his garden and into the McDonald's garden, which had a particularly long grassy drive. Running, his breath coming out like a steam engine, he arrived beneath the window of Kieran's bedroom. How to get her attention? He looked around and found a couple of small stones under the pretty prickly pine tree planted successfully after one of the McDonald's family Christmas festivities. Fraser threw the first stone and waited for a reaction at Kieran's window. Nothing. He picked up another stone and threw it higher. This time Kieran appeared, her eyes and nose looking red and raw from crying continuously for the last few days. She stared down at her best friend, pleased but surprised to see him. Fraser, what are you doing? Why have you come here? It's only six o'clock in the morning, she whispered. Fraser, feeling very worried at seeing his friend looking so unhappy, said with some urgency in his voice, Kieran, get dressed and come down with me to the seashore. I want to talk to you. Come on, you must come. All right, I'll get dressed. Meet me at the back garden gate. I'll see you there. And with that, Kieran closed the window, drew the curtains and dressed as quickly as she could. Without making a noise, avoiding the two steps on the staircase, which she knew squeaked, she made her way out of the house. And there, as arranged, was her best friend Fraser, grinning encouragingly at her. They walked in a comfortable silence until they reached the beach and suddenly the sun began to rise at the dawn of a beautiful day. The bird life was stirring and Fraser said to Kieran, I had to see you, Kieran. I wanted to tell you about the back pocket job that my granny passed on to me which helped me so much when I was so sad about my cat dying which I know will help you too. Fraser and Kieran talked and chatted and gradually, gradually Kieran's face showed that she had understood Granny MacDonald's phrase, back pocket job. And this made her feel so much happier and accepting of the death of dear old Monty. It wasn't long before Kieran and Fraser were running along the shoreline, tossing shells into the water, laughing and enjoying the early morning ambience, a new day, a new understanding of life. Mr and Mrs MacDonald were very relieved to see their daughter return to a happy state of mind. Perhaps their household would return to normal now, as Mr MacDonald had chosen not to travel while his daughter was in such a state of despair. Mrs MacDonald, from there on, in changed her attitude towards Fraser, who she realised was such a good influence on her daughter in many ways and a really good friend. She often provided tea for the pair after they had returned from one of their cliff climbing expeditions and treated Fraser more like a son. Six months later, Kieran returned home one day from school and both parents were there waiting for her big grins on their faces. What are you doing looking so pleased about? said Kieran with a puzzled note in her voice. We have something for you, Kieran. Look in the lounge. There, in front of a vigorous burning log fire, to her great surprise and joy, Kieran saw a small wicker basket with a red tartan blanket inside it and sleeping peacefully with one ear draped over the side of the basket 
was a black and white spotted Dalmatian puppy looking blissfully unaware of the joy that he was giving as Kieran approached his bed and stroked his little head. Oh, Mum and Dad, he's adorable. Thank you so much. You couldn't have given me a better present. What should we call him? We will leave that to you, darling, said a pleased and relieved Mrs MacDonald, basking in the bubbly and happy return of her daughter's personality. Kieran gathered up her new puppy and rushed next door to see her best friend Fraser, who had also just come in from school and was tucking into a large slice of his favourite lemon drizzle cake and drinking a cup of Rosie Lee, as Granny MacDonald called a cup of tea, as she entered the household unannounced. Look, Fraser, look what Mum and Dad have just given me, showing off her spotty puppy alternately wiggling and licking her. What shall I call him? Kieran said excitedly. Fraser looked from Kieran to the puppy and said without hesitation, Nelson, call him Nelson, because he was he has one black patch on his eye amongst all the other spots. Oh, yes, said Kieran. What a great name for a lovely Dalmatian puppy. Nelson it is. From that time onwards, Kieran never forgot her old dog Monty, but having put the many happy memories of time spent with him in her back pocket, this allowed her to look forward and what adventures she, Fraser and Nelson had together, but that is another tale. As a footnote, as time moved on, Kieran and Fraser remained best friends until one day a few years later, they decided to get married and set up home together. The first family dog that came to live with them was a cuddly chocolate coloured Labrador puppy. What do you think they called him? Yes, it just had to be as you might have guessed, Monty too. Wow. That was good, wasn't it? <laughs>